Let's open with a word of prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be back together as family again and to open your word. I pray, Lord God, that you would guide our conversation this night and that we would honor you with what we say and how we say it. Lord, I pray that you would give me wisdom uh, to answer the question that's been set before us. And I pray, Lord, that you would create in us clean hearts, pure motives, and righteousness because of who you are and who you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you for your work in us. And thank you for your presence every single day in every single moment. You comfort us, Lord God. You console us. You give us strength and boldness. You give us wisdom and discernment. And for all of these things, we give you praise. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, uh, Bible books, beginning with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Well done. I still love just hearing you guys do that. I remember the first week we did it, you were like, what? <laughs> That's so much fun. Our question this evening is one of church history and theology. And so I'm going to enjoy unpacking this tonight. The question reads as follows. My Catholic friends say the biggest difference between Catholics and Christians is the way we receive communion. They believe their way is the only right way because they view communion as truly eating the body of Christ and drinking His blood. What is your teaching on this? Well, as I read through that question, I actually identified three different questions that all need dealing with. And so I'm going to try to unpack that a little bit this evening. First, and I know it's just the semantics of wording, but I want to make sure that we're clear. The question begins with the difference between Catholics and Christians. And the answer is there isn't any because Catholics are Christians. So what do we call ourselves when we're Christian and we're not Catholic. So let's start with in the beginning of the church, Acts chapter 2, you have the beginnings of the church that then goes through the first thousand years of church history as a singular unit, a singular church. There was one church, and that was the Catholic church. They didn't call it that then, it was just the church. Um, but in 1054, we had the first major split. And that's where the Eastern Church, or the Orthodox Church, separated from what then started calling itself the Catholic Church. And the big argument between them was whether or not there should be a pope. Was there a singular leader of the church? Up until that time, there were diocese bishops that, that oversaw the entire bishopric, but they didn't have a singular leader. And the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Church, decided that they wanted to have a singular leader. Instead of having all the cardinals as equals, they wanted one more individual, one step up that would kind of oversee all the cardinals that was equal with the cardinals. And it so because of what Jesus says about Peter being the rock on which he would build his church, and there's some discussion on that verse that we can do in other lessons. Um, 
the Catholic Church said, we're going to honor Peter as the first pope, and we're going to look at all of the folks that he trained and all the folks that they trained and all the folks that they trained down to our modern leaders, and we'll call the Bishop of Rome the Pope. And so that is what split the Eastern Church from the Western Church because the Eastern Church didn't want a Pope. They just wanted to continue with the cardinal system, and they have. So if you know anybody that's uh, Eastern Orthodox or are Greek Orthodox or are Coptic or are from any of those, that's that first break in 1054. So the one church becomes two churches at that point. It's still one church. They're all Christians. It's just leadership issue. And then we get from 1054, the next 500 years is pretty quiet again until we get to 1517. And in 1517, this cat from Germany by the name of Luther decided to shake up the, the, shake the boat. And so what happens in 1517 is in that in those years uh, between 1054 and 1517, there were a lot of changes in world history and in the West. And what had happened is that the Catholic Church became very enmeshed with the governmental political system of Europe. And it had become a corrupt organization. The popes were no longer... Uh, Assign or the, the 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 followers of the previous pope, they were starting to become political appointments. I mean, you stop and think about old history. You have the king of England. Well, who crowns the king? The priest, because it was understood that the authority to lead a nation was given by God. So, if the priest is the one who puts the crown on the king, who's really in charge? And so there was a very corrupt system in the Catholic Church. And so Luther begins to identify some of those difficulties. He starts to identify some of those problems both within the theology of the church and what, how they were handling the Bible and what they were doing politically in the community around them. And so this group of Christian leaders challenged the church on how things were operating and they were called by the church protestants because they were protesting okay so you have this protestant movement or as we say it today protestant movement that begins luther never intended to start his own church the roman catholic church kicked him out and Calvin, and Zwingli, and every other one of the Protestant leaders were excommunicated from the church. They could no longer have communion. They could no longer interact. They lost their membership. They lost all rights to worship with that group. They were expelled. And one of the things that I want to talk most about tonight is this idea of how do we handle the inner church conversations? Because what you have to understand is... <clears throat> For about the next 250 years of world history, Catholics and Protestants are killing one another. This is not just a debate on the floor. This is, you're going to hell and I'm going to introduce you. Uh, it, it, it's a very violent time in church history and there's a lot of things done in the name of the church that had to have just made Jesus weep that his name and his church were used in that way. So now we have these three major branches of Christianity. The Orthodox or Eastern Church, the Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church. All three are Christian. All three have different systems of government. All three have different ways of worship. And all three have slightly distinct theology. So that brings me to the second point of this question. The friends say the biggest difference between Catholics and Christians is communion. That is entirely overly simplified. There are a laundry list of theological differences between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And so I'd like to talk through those. And I think the easiest way to approach that would actually be to go back to Luther's writing and what are called the five solas. Okay? Sola is Latin for only. 
Okay? And when Luther was writing, <clears throat> he talked about salvation by grace alone, sola gracia, through faith alone, sola fide, in Christ alone, sola Christa, according to the scriptures alone, sola scriptura, for God's glory alone, sola Deo gloria. So what he wrote in Latin, let me just put into English again without the Latin in between. How are we saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, for God's glory alone. Okay? So, by grace, through faith, in Christ, according to the scripture, for God's glory. So let's take each one of those apart because there are some, some very dynamic dis, di, distinguishings and distinctives here. In the Protestant church, salvation is by grace. Within the Catholic church, salvation is by merit. Okay? It is deemed that you're worthy or it's 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 that you have done these certain things that god grants you his grace and we'll unpack that more when we get to the next one but ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 for great by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of god not of works that any man should boast. So this was one of the areas that Luther looked at and said, wait, you're, you've got this merit-based system and that's not in the scriptures. And we are saved by grace alone. And so he says, salvation by grace, not by merit. Um, how do we know we are saved? Because Christ, not because of me. That's the first difference. The second then is through faith alone. And that begins to speak to this idea of justification. How are we declared just or righteous before God? And the difference in theology here is that the Catholic brothers and sisters, and by the way, I've entitled this evening's talk Our Catholic Family, okay? I'm not throwing stones, and if I could get Father Joseph up here, I would enjoy having a, a, a back and forth and, and let you guys just hear it straight from. Uh, I, I'm not embarrassed to do that at all. Father Joseph is very, very articulate and would be a, a, a good person to chat with about these things. But the idea is... The Catholic Church has a system of works. You do certain things to gain justification. Where the Protestant faith holds that that justification is a gift and it's immediate. So let me unpack this a little bit from Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Now remember that the Old Testament law was a system of works. If you violate this sin, how do you get cleansed? You go do this offering. And the Catholic Church still very much works on that motif. Uh, the the uh, <sighs> penitence issues. If you've done this sin, you have to do this many Hail Marys. If you've done this thing, then you have to do this many good works. It's, it's, it's a works-based system of how are you justified. Now, I want to say this very clearly. Within the Protestant faith, we hold two words to be different, where in the Catholic Church, they use them as an overlap. Within Protestant theology, we talk about the idea of justification being called just by God, 
and sanctification, which is Him making us holy. In the Catholic theology, justification is a both and. They don't use sanctification the way the Protestant church does. They use sanctification to say you have become sanctus or a saint. So it's a totally different process of sainthood as opposed to how Jesus makes you better every single day. So when the Catholic speaks about justification, it is a process when a Protestant speaks about justification, it is an instant and immediate justification. We are declared righteous by God because of Christ. And then he begins the work of sanctification that is making us holy as he is holy. And so that's a difference in terminology, but that then works out in the way that the two churches practice Okay, the way we worship, the way we come to God, and the theology that we have. One of the main differences is that we believe as Protestants that grace is given by God because He wants to. And that it is constant and that it is available. Within the Catholic Church, that grace is dispensed when you do certain things. And there are actually seven things within the Catholic theology that are these dispensations of grace or these conferences of grace. You do this and you get grace. Okay, And so those things are sometimes referred to or oftentimes referred to as sacraments. These are the things you do to gain grace from God. And within the Catholic faith, the grace of God is conferred through baptism, through Eucharist or communion, through confirmation, when you go through the confirmation process, through reconciliation, which is also referred to in confession, so reconciliation is, I know I messed up, I go talk to the priest about what I messed up, I find out what the penitence is, and I go do whatever it is to regain the grace from God. Okay? So, that's, so we've got baptism and Eucharist or communion, confirmation, which is the education process, and being sealed. The interesting thing about the confirmation in the Catholic theology Protestants believe the moment that you receive Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's part of what is taught in Paul's writings. The Catholic faith believes that that seal is conferred by Christ through the priest. And that's what confirmation is. Confirmation is the, the process of being sealed in the Holy Spirit after you've had the education and the baptism and you've received first Eucharist and, and those things. Okay? So, baptism and Eucharist and confirmation and then reconciliation or confession and penitence and that whole process. Then the next one is called, in old terms, extreme unction. And what that is, is the anointing of the sick. That is, you receive a special grace of the passion of Christ in His Holy Week when your body is injured and sick as His body was injured and sick in that process of crucifixion and torture. And so that giving of the extreme unction or the anointing of the sick, most of us know about that because you want to do that for the final time if you expect someone to die. And so you've probably heard of last rites. Well, last rites is the final process of the extreme unction. It's all part of that process. So when you are sick and you go to the priest, for the laying on of hands and for prayer rather than the way the Protestants understand it that we are asking the Holy Spirit to act in that life. The Catholics say that you are being connected directly to Christ in His passion and you receive from Him the healing 
that, um, that his stripes on the cross and crucifixion bore for us. So it's the application of by his stripes we are healed, but it's in a different theology. It's in a different understanding of what's going on in the spiritual realm. And then marriage is one of the graces because God consistently talks about his bride, the church. He talks about in the Old Testament, his bride, Israel. And since God consistently talks about his relationship with people in terms of marriage, then being married is one of the ways we receive grace from God because we're learning about a marriage relationship that then helps us to then connect with God better when he uses that marital relationship as an example. And then the final uh, form of grace or dispensation of grace is for the reserved few, and that is ordination. That is becoming a priest or a deacon or having that because that's a special level of grace to be the minister within a congregation. So these are these dispensations of grace. And again, what, what the difference is, is the Catholics are saying, you do these things and God gives you grace. And the Protestants say, no, grace comes because Christ wants us to have it. And it's there anytime we need it. And so there's a, there's a very different theology. There are very different understanding of how God interacts with us. Another one of these uh, is the through Christ alone. And that is... How do we connect with God? In the Protestant faith, we hold to the idea that if you want to talk to Jesus, start. Okay? There is no one between you. We are a um, priesthood of all believers. Okay? And, and a verse for this is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So who mediates between me and God? Jesus. Okay? So the Protestant faith holds to the idea of this priesthood of all believers that we can go directly to God. Whereas in the Catholic faith, you may pray, but the reality is, is Christ works in and through the priesthood. So where we would, where the Protestants would look at, um, how do I understand the scriptures? Well, I open them up and I read them and the Holy Spirit and Christ teach me. And the Catholics say, no, there is this body called the magisterium. And the magisterium is the theological headshed at the Vatican who decides what every passage is interpreted to mean. They are theologians who spend their entire life helping the church, which is why the Catholic Church has a unified theology. Because it has a theological group, the magisterium, who have said, thus saith the Lord for our church, period, end of discussion. One of the problems we have in Protestantism is that everybody gets to read the book for themselves, and if I disagree with you, I just go start my own church. And so we've got 170 different denominations on the Protestant side, because every time we have a disagreement, we start a new label. <sighs> The Catholic Church says there's one faith, and it's the faith we dictate. So if you want to be a part of the Catholic Church, you ascribe to the Catholic faith. And if you have a disagreement with it, get over it. This is truth, and this is the only truth truth. And so that is a, another one of those huge distinctions between the two. So if I have Christ as my intermediate, then when I sin, I can confess to you or I can confess to Christ or because he says that you confess one to another. Well, why would I do that? Because you're going to forgive me? Well, if, I'm, if you're the one I offended, sure. But you can't, you can't forgive me for God. Um, so I'm sharing my 
sins with you. I'm confessing my sins to you because if I tell you, hi, my name's Mark, I'm an alcoholic. Everybody says, hi, Mark. Anyway, the, the, the reality is, what are you going to do when you see me on the second from the last row at Walmart? What are you doing in the wine section, brother? That accountability. You see, we confess to one another not because we receive forgiveness from one another, but because we have already received forgiveness from God and we are now sharing with our brothers and sisters so that they can hold us accountable and keep us out of mischief. So when I sin, I talk to Jesus. He's my intermediary between God. And Christ and the Holy Spirit then are my intermediary. So I can talk directly to God through Christ. Where the Catholic Church says, okay, yes, you can, but you speak to Christ and he speaks back through the priest. Think of the priest as the antenna. Think of the priest as a walkie-talkie. Okay? If you want to talk to God, you push the button, and it goes that way. And then when God's ready to speak back, he comes back through that same walkie-talkie. And I don't mean that to be mocking in any way. I'm trying to use an illustration that the priest is not God. He's simply the antenna, the, the conduit. But in the Catholic faith, if you really want to have that conversation with God, you need to hear from Him as well, so you have to speak to the priest. Therefore, you have, in every Catholic church, a confessional where you go and speak to the priest about your sins, and He is in that moment standing in the stead of Christ to judge your sins and your actions and to provide for you a penitence. That is a work that you can do to show your contrition, to show that you're truly sorry for what you've done, and to try to make amends. And so at the end of the confessional, the priest will give the individual a penance. That is X number of Hail Marys, X number of community service hours, X number of you need to go do these things to show God you're really sorry and to make amends for the things that you've done. So when you have a system where a priest is the one that I confess to and he tells me what I'm supposed to do to make that right with God. You see how we refer to that from the Protestant perspective as a system of works. How am I gaining forgiveness? By doing these prayers and doing these hours of community service. Doing these things that I've been called to do. Well, here's another problem then. I can probably rack up more penance than I am going to be able to complete in my lifetime. Anybody else in that? Okay. I, 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 can, I can sin faster than I can work my way out of that hole. There's an old joke, you know, when you find yourself at the bottom of a hole, quit digging. You know, and, and so that's what's really going on in this idea of a priest giving a penance. Well, I'm doing this penance, and while I'm doing this penance, I'm still sinning. So I go back with those sins, and I get more penance. And I go back with those sins, and I get more penance. And by the time I die, I've still got all of these penance to pay off. Am I saved? Yes. Am I going to heaven? Absolutely. Just as soon as you finish paying off the penance. And so in the Catholic theology, there is this place called purgatory. It is a place where you go when you die to finish paying off that penance. And it is not a nice place. It is a place, it's called purgatory, because it is the place where your sins are purged from you. That's where the word purgatory comes from, is from a purging, okay? The difficulty that Protestants have with that is summed up in an old evangelical song. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left his crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. 
I don't have to pay penance. Christ paid that bill in total on the cross. So this is a huge issue in the differences between our churches. We hold that Christ's forgiveness is total. The Catholic Church holds that Christ will pay for the eternal, but you pay for the temporal. You have to pay for your sins while you're still here. Okay? Um, another issue that comes up with this, how do you access God? We say through Christ. The Catholic Church says the veneration of the saints. What is the veneration of the saints? Well, how many of you guys have ever heard of praying to the saints? L let me just share with you right now, that is not a doctrine of the Catholic Church. Has never been. It is a practice of a lot of Catholics because they don't understand their own theology. In the Catholic mindset, the saints can hear you. So, how many of you have ever asked somebody at church to pray for you? Why? Because Jesus talks to them too. Well, wouldn't it be a whole lot better to talk to somebody who was in Jesus' neighborhood? You know, like one of the saints? So, I'm not really praying to the saint. I'm praying through the saint in catholic theology they say I, I just like you would ask your neighbor to pray for you because he's still living we ask the dead who are in the presence of christ and we know they're already there and not in purgatory because saints don't go to purgatory saints are saints they've gotten in that grace that is merited because of what they did on earth. They were saints, so they, straight in, they don't go through purgatory. So if I pray and I speak to saint whoever and say, hey, would you walk down the block and talk to Jesus for me? That's the way their theology works. Now, again, in practice, there's a whole lot of Catholics that pray to saints and worship the saints, and that's not the teaching. Now, they do worship Mary, because Mary has a very special place in Christianity. She is the vessel through which the King of Kings and Lord of Lords was brought into humanity. She has the most spectacular, intimate relationship with God that we, we can't even begin to get our heads around because I, I have never met a virgin that gave birth to Emmanuel. You know what I'm saying? When you stop and think about what's going on in that little girl's life. Well, the problem is, even though both Protestants and Catholics honor Mary, we say, wow, she was some girl. Just like that boy she was running with, who raised Jesus as a stepson and took care of him his entire life and taught him how to worship and taught... Man, Joseph has got it going on. The Catholics would say, wait, if she is Jesus mother then she is the queen of heaven because she is the mother of God because Jesus is God in the flesh so if you have a huge prayer that's where the Hail Marys come in because you know you think about the, the, the Bible stories where um, Mary tried to influence Jesus. Did Jesus want to turn water into wine at the wedding in Cana? No. He looked over at her and said, Woman, it's not my time. This has nothing to do with me. And she went and talked to the stewards and she kept harassing stuff and he finally went, Whatever. And he turns the water into wine. So, I mean, who better to get God to do what you want him to than his mama who will grab him by the ear and make him behave? And I don't mean that again sarcastically. I, I'm just trying to help you to understand the, the reverence they have for Mary because of her position. And again, the Protestants would say, yeah, she gave birth and raised this boy. Good on her. But she's not all that. She's not the fourth part of the Trinity. Uh, she is not worthy to be worshipped. She is not worthy to be praised. Um, 
So that's another part of it. And then let's talk about the body of Christ for a moment. Because we're going to get some mixed metaphors here that are going to really mess up when we get to communion, which is the third and final thing tonight. But is what is the body of Christ? The church. What about that thing that was on the cross? What about that thing that raised from the dead? What about that thing that is seated at the right hand of the Father? You see how we have a body of Christ that is his actual physical body, and we have a body of Christ that is the church. So which one are you talking about when you say the body of Christ? You see what I'm saying here? And so the reality is, is when you start to deal with the theological aspects of that question, when we get baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are we being baptized into Christ in His spiritual body? Or are we being baptized into Christ in His physical body, which is the church? How do you answer that question? And see, the Protestants would say the act of baptism is joining Christ in spirit. And the Catholics say, no, it is joining yourself to the body of Christ, which is the church. So you are baptized into the Catholic faith. This is why the Catholic faith has the ability to excommunicate you. They can say, no, you're not a part of us. Okay? And so every Catholic fears that. I, I know Catholics who have not had communion for years because they made some priest angry. Because they violated some rule or something. Uh, most of you, I'm sure by this point, have read the article that I wrote in this last newsletter. If you hadn't, go look at the newsletter at my musings. Um, that pastor in question, I didn't make it a part of that because it wasn't important. It still isn't. But he's Catholic. And so the church said this individual wasn't using the right set of words the right way, so we're going to nullify every baptism he's done for the last 30 years. You see where there's this difference in the way we think about things. And by the way, this is really going to create a mixed metaphor because they're going to argue that the communion becomes the body and blood of Christ. So it just became a church building? What's the body of Christ? Is, is the bread and wine at communion the literal physical body of, the, of Christ? I thought you said the church was the body of Christ and that's what we were baptized into. We've got a mixed metaphor going on here. Uh, and and that's, that's one of the problems that we'll run into as we continue with this doctrine issue. The next part of these five is the doctrine based on Scripture alone. You see, within the Protestant faith, how do we know what God thinks? Open the book. Read what God said. Go and do thou likewise. The Catholic faith holds equal Scripture and tradition. If it is a tradition of the church, if it is something the church has always done, if this is where the priests have led us, then it is equal to God's written word. And so there are several things that are in the Catholic church that we say, wait a minute, show me a scripture verse for that, and they will quote us back to a historical moment or one of the councils or one of these other things because these councils and these creeds and these things that are a part of the church history are the tradition that are equal to what the scripture says. And so they have been able to modify what the Bible says as time has gone forward. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, 
thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I'm not going to quote you every various scripture. I think there's seven of them in scriptures where it says, do not add and do not subtract from this word. Protestants would hold to that. Catholics were talking. Well, we're not adding to it. The tradition is the continuing revelation of God. We're not adding to the scripture. We're adding to tradition. But if you hold tradition equal to Scripture, didn't you just add to the Scripture? So these are some of those arguments that, that we have with our Catholic friends and family around the uh, dinner table at Thanksgiving. So the rites, the sacraments, the traditions, all are equal to Scripture. And there's one more that you need to be aware of, and those are called papal decrees. A papal decree means the Pope said something. Now, this doesn't happen very often. In fact, the last time there was a papal decree was 1950. But from time to time, the Pope gives a statement that is binding on the church because he is the vicar of Christ in the Catholic mindset. He is that person who stands in the place of Christ as head of the church. And so if he says it, it becomes doctrine. It is now part of that tradition that is equal to Scripture. Um, just for you know, some fun trivia, if you have ever been to a big Catholic church, not the local parish like we've got here, I'm talking like St. Louis, you get up there, those churches we have a special name from that came from Western history. No, it didn't. We call them cathedrals. Why do we call it a cathedral? Because it is the head church of a diocese. It is all of the little parishes in the area answer to a diocese, a bigger area. Think there's a church in every town, but there's a diocese over the state. Okay, That's actually the way it is in Arkansas. There is the, the Diocese of Little Rock covers the entire state of Arkansas. Every Catholic church is under the cardinal that is in Little Rock. Okay, so they're all part of that diocese. So, by the way, the, the Little Rock or the St. Louis or some of these other cathedrals have, if you ever go into them, somewhere on the stage, usually off on the, my, my right, your left, will be a throne, a big chair. It's called Peter's chair. And what happens is... If the Pope comes to visit your diocese, that's his chair. No one ever sits in that chair except the Pope. That is the cathedra. So the building that holds that chair is a cathedral. Cathedral. Okay? And so if the priest, if the Pope rather, is going to make one of these doctrine forming statements a papal decree he will always do it sitting in that chair so it is referred to as being ex cathedra out of saint peter's chair so if a pope makes a statement ex cathedra it's a papal decree that now becomes law equal to what the scriptures say protestants have a problem with that Catholics don't. Huge difference between us theologically. Um, and so finally, all glory to God. All glory to God. Solo or soli deo gloria. All glory to God. Not to popes, not to Mary, not to priests, not to saints. All glory to God. Because Luther and a lot of those that followed after him have a problem with how much we worship and glorify these various people that aren't God. And 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11 speaks to this idea. 1 Peter 4 and 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, 
that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Do not hear me saying that Catholics are practicing idolatry. Some of them are, but not everybody in a Protestant church is saved either. Okay? What I'm saying is that they've put a wrong emphasis in over-glorifying and giving credit where the Holy Spirit and Christ should be given credit. They've given it to someone else. And that's something that, that we have a problem with. Again, one of those huge issues. And by the way, I'm not going to get into all of the art and iconography and all of that stuff. It's not as bad as it's made out to be. And once you understand what's really going on, they're not worshiping that stuff. They're not praying to that stuff. It's a reminder. And by the way, if you ever look at almost every painting, sculpture, or anything else that has the Madonna and child, Mary is always pointing to Christ. If she's ever painted with the child, she will be bringing glory to Christ. There's a lot of folks like, a great big Mary in this, hey, baby Jesus. Yeah, but look what Mary's doing. In almost every one of those paintings and sculptures, she is pointing to Jesus. She is giving the glory to Jesus. Catholics aren't that different from us in some of the ways they present. They are very different from us in other ways that they present. And these are fun things to argue about over the kitchen table. They have some deeper implications in the way we practice and the way we believe. But to say that the differences between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church is just the way we do communion? No, there's a whole lot more going on than just that. Okay. So finally, I'm going to get around answering the, the, the question that was being asked. What's the thing with communion? <laughs> Three different understandings of what happens at this table exist within Christendom. Okay? There is one thing at one end and one thing at another end and one in the middle and there are people all through the church that hold all kinds of places between those. I'm one of them and so are you. What's going on when we come to this table? For Catholics, they believe in something called transubstantiation. Great big 50 cent theological word. That the substance of God translates into the substance of that wafer and wine. That in that moment when the priest with his back to the congregation lifts up the wafer and the wine and says, this is the body of Christ and somebody rings a bell. This is the blood of Christ and you hear the bell. In that moment, the physical presence of Christ imbues itself to the physical material of that cracker and wine and it becomes the body and blood of Christ. That is transubstantiation. Um, by the way, if you follow Catholic theology in that, before you eat and drink, you can go ahead and pray to it because that's Jesus right there in your palm. Literally, if you, if you take that doctrine to its extreme, you can pray to that because it is the physical embodiment of Christ present with you. Um, I'll come back to some other thoughts in that. The, the middle ground is called consubstantiation or the substance of God with those elements, with that wafer and that. Um, this was actually Luther's position. He's the one that came up with consubstantiation. And his idea was that the presence of God is under, over, around, and through. His example was like an iron rod in a fire, united but not changed. 
And so this whole thought process is that Christ is actually spiritually present in a real and profound way. But the cracker is still a cracker and the wine is still wine. Nothing happens to the elements. It's just the, the presence of Christ is in that moment in communion with you in the spiritual. And then the other third camp is that of the memorial. That is to say, the elements are just a symbol. And it is just something that we do to remember. It's, 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 it's no more, and I don't want to say this, I, I don't want to be, to be too crass with this, it's no more than the hot dog at 4th of July. That's what you do here. It's a symbol. It's an element. And, and you can use any cracker and you can use whatever drink. The, the whole point is that you're celebrating communion. You, you could use a peanut butter sandwich and a Coke if, that's, if your intention is, because it's just a symbol. It, it doesn't have to be a cracker and wine. And that would be the far extreme to this side. And then the Catholic transubstantiation is the, the far on this side. And you can see that, where do you fall in that? If I were to ask you around this, this class, we, we, we'd have 15, 20 different answers. Okay? What's really going on? Most of us have never thought about it. I take communion and I'm focused on Christ. I'm not focused on what's actually happening with these elements. But the theological arguments are what's going on in that moment between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And so Catholics do hold to the point that they're the only ones that are doing it right because they're the only ones that reverence the actual physical presence of God in the building. This raises several issues. Um, with transubstantiation, what do you do with leftovers? I mean, are you just going to take the body and blood of Christ and throw it in a trash can? So do you know what actually happens to it? The priest eats and drinks. The priest takes care of the leftovers. There are never, ever leftovers. Which, by the way, comma, is why there is a portion of Catholic priests that have alcohol issues. Because in Catholicism, they celebrate the Mass every day. So that priest is having to take care of the leftovers from every service every day. You think about that in terms of a priest that you know that might be having one or two different churches or may offer Mass three or four times a day. And you can start to see why some of them would have a problem with that. Not all of them. Um, it's, it's not a... It's not a denominational thing. It's just it's so that you can understand because some people are like, man, I hear about these priests that get defrocked because they have, you know, they're drunks. It's part of that system. And if they already have the propensity towards that addiction, they fall victim to that. Luke chapter 22, verse 19 through 20. Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. This verse by the way, is used by those who hold the memorial. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. That's the key thing, is do this in remembrance of me so the cracker and the wine don't matter. Okay? It's just a symbol. Jesus, I think, theologically, well, I don't think, I know. Jesus was saying theologically, this is my body to a specific piece of cracker from the Passover Seder. He was not simply saying, this cracker is my body, 
we know because of what we understand from the Passover Seder, which, by the way, we'll be doing April 15th. Uh, go ahead and sign up on the sheet out there and to participate with us. But if we look at the Passover Seder, he was taking a known quantity of the afikomen, the bread in the middle of a Passover Seder plate that has been hidden and was broken and was pierced and was part of the messianic looking forward to. And Jesus said, I'm the fulfillment of it. This bread that you have understand what the Messiah will be, I'm it. This is my body. This is me. And this third cup, the cup of sanctification, is my blood. You're going to be sanctified by my blood. So Jesus saying, this is my body, was referencing the cracker. This is my blood, was referencing a specific piece of wine, or a specific cup of wine. There's a whole lesson wrapped up in the Passover there. But there are are those who would take this and say, no, he said this is my body, so it has to be his body, transubstantiation. So it's how do you interpret that verse? Consider with me John chapter 6. John chapter 6, I'm going to read a long passage here, but I, I want you to think about this for just a minute. John chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 22. Just after Jesus has fed the 5,000 and walked across the water, the next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, and as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it's not Moses who has given you bread from heaven. But it's my Father who has given you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day." At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, 
I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever." He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. I'm going to stop there. So what did Jesus just say about communion? My flesh is real flesh. My blood is real blood. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Sounds a lot like transubstantiation. And yet, in a few verses later, he says, it's the Spirit that gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. So is he being literal? Is he being spiritual? How do we interpret that? Is Jesus drawing metaphors and illustrative teaching, or is he proclaiming that the bread and wine is his actual flesh and blood? And note the disciples' reaction. <laughs> Wait, what? I'm not sure I can understand that teaching. And oh, by the way, I would also ask you to note the Romans' reactions. Because as the church begins to grow, it is outlawed by Rome because of the cannibalism that the early church, because they were eating the flesh and drinking the blood of this Jesus guy. Aren't they cannibals? Roman, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'll try to wrap this up. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud when they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. Interesting. The manna and the water. Spiritual food, spiritual drink. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, Christ was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as an example, and we were written, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we partake of the one loaf. 
Consider the people of Israel. They do not eat though, I'm sorry, do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? Do I mean that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than He? Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in a sacrifice, then don't eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake, the other man's conscience. I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jew, Jew, Greek, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow Christ. What's Paul saying here about spiritual food and spiritual drink? What's Paul saying about food offered to idols? And the same paragraph he's talking about communion. How is Paul paralleling our communion with God and the potential for idolatry? These are deep questions, which is why that spectrum is so wide. How about the one that we know so well? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we're judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone's hungry, you should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. When I come, I will give further directions. The cup is a new covenant in my blood. Wait, that's not my body anymore. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat and drink, you proclaim the Lord's death. Guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord if you do it in an unworthy manner. So the body and the blood are... (sighs) You start to see as I've laid out these various verses how that spectrum developed. How do you read what's going on with those things? Consider the Didache, my last thing tonight. Didache is the teaching of the disciples, was written somewhere in the latter half of the first century. This book says, At the Eucharist, offer the Eucharistic prayer in this way. 
begin with the chalice. We give thanks to thee, our Father, for the holy vine of thy servant David, which thou hast made known to us through thy servant Jesus. Then over the broken bread, we give thanks to thee, our Father, for the life and knowledge thou hast made known to us through thy servant Jesus. As this broken bread, once dispersed over the hills, was brought together and became one loaf, so may thy church be brought together from the ends of the earth into thy kingdom. No one is to eat or drink of your Eucharist, but those who have been baptized in the name of the Lord. For the Lord's own saying applies here, Give not that which is holy unto dogs. When all have partaken sufficiently, give thanks in these words. Thanks be to thee, Holy Father, for thy sacred name which thou hast caused to dwell in our hearts, and for the knowledge and faith and immortality which thou hast revealed to us through thy servant Jesus. Thou, O Almighty Lord, hast created all things for thine own name's sake. To all men thou hast given meat and drink to enjoy, that they may give thanks to thee. But to us thou hast graciously given spiritual meat and drink, together with life eternal, through the servant, through thy servant. Especially and above all do we give thanks to thee for the mightiness of thy power. Be mindful of thy church, O Lord, deliver it from all evil, perfect it in thy love, sanctify it, and gather it from the four winds into the kingdom which thou hast prepared for it. Let grace come, and this present world pass away. Whoever is holy, let him approach. Whoso is not, let him repent. So what was the early church practicing? as opposed to what we're doing 2,022 years later. Some of the issues that we as Protestants have with the, con with the transubstantiation is how can a physical body be in all places and at all times? How can that become the physical blood and body here and Nigeria and Ukraine? It's a question that we've got. It's part of this understanding. Isn't a spiritual understanding more fitting? And yet, don't Jesus' words and the disciples' writing indicate far more than just a symbolic memorial? So, when it comes to the issue of communion, I think most of us haven't thought through there is something incredible going on at this table. And I don't think we'll ever be able to define it by consubstantiation, transubstantiation, memorial, or any other doctrine. What we know is that we meet Jesus at this table. And we will never fully understand what that means. We can argue about it, and the church has for 2,000 years. But as we close tonight, I, I just, like I said, as, as I read through that question, there were these three issues. One, Catholics are Christians. And it bothers me when groups decide to go witnessing to Catholics. They don't understand the Bible the way we do, but we don't understand the Bible the way they do either. And maybe we need to have a dialogue rather than a mission trip. And we have significant differences in theology. But I will tell you that Father Joseph and every one of his predecessors has sat at our table in this fellowship hall in our ministerial alliance and hung out with us Protestants. Maybe we're his mission field. I don't know. But we're able to reverence one another's faith and respect one another's doctrine in conversation. Because you know what? we might get to heaven and find out all of us were wrong. So maybe we just need to treat each other with love and respect and stop throwing rocks at each other. And when we come to this communion, let us within our own heart between our God as we understand Him who gave of Himself both as an unbegotten or first begotten Son and as a Savior who willingly laid down His life, how do I approach this table in a worthy manner? I better have my head screwed on straight and not just
flip up to this thing because it's snack time. There's something going on here that we need to reverence because whatever is happening in the physical is happening in the spiritual. And when we commune with God, He is present. And we better honor that. Heavenly Father, I thank You for this teaching tonight and I pray that it has been presented in a way that honors all of Your children. Help us to understand You better. Help us to step away from the seat of judgment as to who's Christian and who isn't. Help us to open dialogue with our brothers and sisters, our Catholic family, that we might find those points of commonality and have those interesting conversations over doctrine and understanding. Lord, I have had so many relationships with ministers from other faiths and I can tell you that I have influenced them and they have influenced me. I pray, Lord God, that You would widen our understanding of Scripture because our natural tendency is to narrow it. Remind us, Lord, every time we try to put You in a box that You are the one who tore the veil from top to bottom and came out of the Holy of Holies and lived and walked among us. You have plans we cannot understand. You have thoughts that we will never grasp. You are so much more than a big us. You are nothing like us. You are holy. You are immortal. You are Creator. You are God. And we praise You, for we are wonderfully and fitfully made. You are a good Creator. You are a passionate Savior. You are a loving Father. And we give You praise. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.